Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, for this wonderful conversation around the film, Julia, moderated by Indie Wires and Thompson. Before we begin, I'm going to introduce myself as I always do. You should know me by now, but my name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the Associate Director of Public Programs and Events here at the IDA. I'm coming to you today from Chicago, which is on the unceded land of the Potawatomi people who have been stewards of this land for generations. Before we get started, I'd like to offer thanks to our media sponsor, IndieWire, for bringing this series to you all. And we're maybe about halfway, maybe a little less through our screening series. You can check out all of our upcoming screenings at www.documentary.org slash screenings dash series and uh, see what we got coming up. It's gonna be great. Um, and without any further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Ann Thompson from IndieWire. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the IDA documentary series. Um, I'm delighted to be back on board uh, with two great documentarians, Julie Cohen and Betsy West, who you all remember from the great RBG. Welcome back. Um, and this time, we're talking about Julia. We're talking about this extraordinary uh, documentary about the great chef, Julia Child. And let's just start at the beginning. Um, how did you come in, uh, on board this project? How did it get started? So, you know, after uh, RBG came out, we really um, had a tremendous opportunity to think through the lives of a lot of American women, um, some that we went out looking for, a number of uh, po potential projects came to us and it was really just a process of looking through and thinking like, what's an amazing story of a groundbreaking woman that would allow us to not only do a biography, but also say, say more and dig into culture. And I think the thought of doing a film that not only told Julia Child's incredible stories we looked to it, but also the amazing transformation of how Americans think about food was just like really appetizing for us. <laughs> you know, we had an incredible bus ride across uh, town when we were talking about Julia in which Julie and I started sharing the names of some of the pretty horrible dishes that we ate as children <laughs> in, the, in the time of, you know, frozen foods and uh, mushroom soup casseroles and uh, hot dog creole. I mean, we just sort of went on and on. And by the end of the bus ride, we said, oh, this will be so much fun. And then we talked about also about really making good food and the preparation of good food a real character in this film and that seemed like a great opportunity uh to us as well to really dig into uh some some cool photography involving food yes you go to town with that and and there's some succulent things uh that you dig into there um so so tell me uh, what some of the um access issues were i mean who who had control over this and and how did, did you have to pitch or did they come to you how did that work no we did go um pitching to the julia child foundation um which does have a lot of access to many of the julia child not only uh, the French chef, which is sort of jointly, um, per permission for that lies jointly with WGBH, the Boston PBS station and the Julia Child Foundation. So kind of both needed to be on board with that, but also like the just unbelievable collection of Paul's just enchanting photos of, of Julia, as well as the letters. And, you know, there were, there were all kinds of things. So um, yes, we went to, um, we went to the Julia Child Foundation and started talking to them about what we had in mind pretty early in the process. And there have been other projects. There was obviously the Meryl Streep uh, movie. There was the mini series. Um, but but what is what is um, what kind of barriers were there in terms of of getting access to everything? Did you did they just open up the doors and and throw you with throw <laughs> throw things at you, or did you have to go digging? 
You know, I, the foundation was very supportive from the beginning. They liked the idea of us taking a look at Julia and putting Julia in a context. I mean, I think we felt that um, a lot of people know the caricature of Julia Child from the Saturday Night Live uh, impression and, uh, and yet uh, did to don't totally understand the extent to which Julia really changed the world for all of us. I mean, the way we eat <laughs> and also, I think less understood is just what a phenomenon Julia was as a middle-aged woman on television. I mean, you just didn't see people like Julia Child on television in the early 1960s. And she really opened up possibilities for women and, and for us as eaters. And I think that the, the foundation and others were really interested to see us uh, dig into that part of Julia's story and how she transformed things. And just to be clear, the foundation actually didn't have that much of the material in their possession. It's just that you needed their permission often for uh, for, for the use of it. Um, a lot of Julia's collection is at the phenomenal Schlesinger Library um, at Harvard, which is a great women's history collection. And there were other Julia and at various PBS stations and uh, ABC where Julia worked, but also there were little pieces of Julia kind of kind of all over um, include and so you know and, and, and a lot of the footage that we were looking for for the film wasn't just Julia direct images per se but things as Betsy said to put Julia in the context of America in the times but even France in the times and Asia since we had Julia going to uh, both uh, Sri Lanka and China, and then of course the Paris years. So the opportunity to uh, really savor just uh, from watching and then figure out how to weave into the film so much of that old archival stuff from all over the world was I think um, part of the challenge, but mainly part of the joy of this project. Yeah, you really did a great job with it, I have to say. And you made her sexy in a way that I never <laughs> would have expected. And and that has to do with Paul. It has to do with the fact that he thought she was sexy. You you get yeah. shots of her beautiful legs and, and uh, you know, you really go out, out of your way to, to present her in a way that we didn't think of her later on. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty romantic story. We like romance and it certainly is there in Paul's incredible photographs and also in the diaries and you just get a sense of the connection that this couple had and also how the how the relationship evolved which we really loved with Paul becoming a very early feminist husband a supportive one you know yes, supporting absolutely. her career in, at the expense of, every of his own exactly all right let's let's lay out for people a little bit of what she was breaking down uh, in terms of gender barriers at the time. Uh, I didn't realize, um, I mean, I knew that the chef schools were male, but she really uh, went in there and, and proved what she could do against a great deal of opposition. Yeah, I mean, Julia had a lot of self-confidence, uh, I think, to just do, go to the Cordon Bleu and to demand that she be able to take not the housewifely classes that they would give to, to American women and other women visiting France, but the real, the real instruction, you know, with the GIs and, you know, didn't seem phased by uh, being the only woman there. Uh, and then, of course, uh, later on, breaking barriers in on television as a successful woman in television, and then, you know, leading the way for showing other women that they could have a career, not just to be good cooks at home necessarily, but to to think of of this as a as a professional opportunity. And Julia is appearing, not you know, as a TV expert at a time yeah. that women were viewed, you know, as, as the film shows, just in a completely different way. And the fact that she wasn't going on the air till she was 50, frankly, I think is one of the things that drew us to this story. I mean, both RBG and Julia really blossomed um, later in their lives and careers. And it's like just so opposite of how women are usually portrayed uh, in documentaries and in narrative films for that matter. And it's really something that we're 
you know, it's just, it's, it's just a it's just a storyline that I think appealed to us for reasons that probably need not be uh, made explicit. But like, you know, w women over fifty like finding themselves rocking, having supportive feminist husbands, and being sexy is something I think that we're in favor of. Is is kind of like not your typical Hollywood portrayal, but but so, so a, a way that we really love showing women. So you actually um, also went out of your way, uh, if I may be so bold, to make this an entertaining movie. This, it, in a way, it's a it's perfect pandemic entertainment. It's it's such an escapist, uh, delightful, sensual, uh, you know, romp uh, through uh, the decades. Um, you didn't writing like... them down for a blurb. <laughs> 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 you didn't lay it down as some, I mean, you get into some, some serious feminist issues along the way, of course, as is your want, but uh, tell me about that balance, what, we, what you were seeking to do there. You know, I think that uh, the tone of the film reflects Julia. You know, Julia was someone who was very serious about cooking and about what she did, but also someone who just like to have fun. And if you think about Julia's success on television, it, it was in spite of the executives and everybody else. It was because Julia went on television uh, as almost as far as the station was concerned, kind of a lark and, and really connected with the audience. And why did she connect with the audience? Because she was authentic. She was herself. And she was kind of funny. She was a character. She wasn't afraid of making mistakes, laughing at herself, and just having a good time at the same time that she was seriously teaching people. And I think that the tone of the film really does reflect our, our subject. Well, part of it, you say she was confident, but the other part of it is that she was in competent and incredibly yes. smart yes um you know because she had to explain how she had to do these things live without cutting right. Right. I mean, so often they were doing a whole half hour shows in, in one take. So the fact that she messed up sometime was just a function of they couldn't edit it out. It wasn't that, as you know, as she says in the film, like people would say I was doing this on purpose. Um, but no, if you're cook in the kitchen, like stuff sometimes falls out and things things happen. And as Betsy said, that's Julia's spirit. And we wanted that spirit of fun to be in the film, I think. Betsy and myself and Carla Gutierrez, who edited this film and also edited RBG, all really share a philosophy of documentaries that like they shouldn't be painful affairs, that like if people are laughing, that's a good thing. Um, and Julia, like, you know, she made people laugh, but like you have to, it's, it's just like being, I guess, like a comic actress versus a dramatic actress. Like comedy is so hard because you have to like have all the basics down. And then on top of that, you're being funny and bringing like character to it. So Julia's like doing her kooksterness while she's also, you know, making often you know, the, the, the one that we use as an example about that, like dark, that dome of caramel thing where all of a sudden she moves down a silver bowl and like this perfectly standing hard caramel is, is standing there. And it's kind of a wonder to behold, even though she's like, you know, kind of, I don't know, yucking it up. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of great moments like that and and you and you put in the 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 the, the Saturday night live stuff and the way that people made fun of her but there here's the point she was the first celebrity chef is that right is that true Yes there had been chefs on television uh before Julia so she was not the very first but I think she was the very first to be so hugely popular to really put PBS on the map uh, with this show that that surprised everybody. So, you know, as Ina Garten says, you know, she she got the train rolling in terms of, uh, you know, you want to call them celebrity chefs uh, going on television after Julia for the past few decades and, you know, into the internet era and Instagram era. So what did you guys do? Did you like recreate her dishes? How did you how did you pull yes. out those sort of beautifully yes. cin so, cinematographic, luscious looking uh, food? So we cake? absolutely did. Every um, you know every recipe that you see in the film is an actual Julia Child recipe 
um, made correctly and real. Like, unlike, you know, if you watch food commercials where stuff often looks good, but they do it with shellac and glue and like, Lord knows, like we took our food home and ate it. It was really good. <laughs> I'm envious. Uh, our, our cook and food stylist, Susan Spungen, um, who actually also did the food in Julie and Julia, um, helped us sort of navigate, you know, we, because we wanted the recipes to go into, to, to work into the plot, we would often talk to her about, you know, like for, for the Julia and, and Paul sex and romance scene. We're like, we want like a really multifaceted, really lush, sexy dessert that Julia, and she starts like listing up, like, I think we went into it thinking chocolate, you yeah. know, you think dessert, you think chocolate, but then she starts describing this pear tart and like, oh, and you're boiling it and poaching it in the wine and swirling it with cinnamon. <laughs> we're like, oh, that sounds nice. And then we were shooting, we shot simultaneously because of COVID. It was all supposed to be in one kitchen. We recreated a authentic Julia kitchen um, in New York. And we ended up shooting with our regular cinematographer, Claudia Rashke uh, in New York and our food specialist cinematographer, Nanda Brediard uh, in, in Paris, shooting the same dishes, but in different ways. And then Carla integrating them in the edit room. Oh, cool. Oh, I yeah. had no idea. That's really, really cool. We're glad. <laughs> we glad you, <laughs> no, you didn't notice. Me. Um, <laughs> so at the end of the movie, you do push into the issues that she faced later in her career. So she, she kind of moved on uh, to different incarnations of herself and, and ran into some obstacles along the way. And it's really sad at the end, the way they kind of push her out. Yeah, it's sad for a moment. And then <laughs> she pushes back and says, you know, forget about it. If you don't want me, I'll do something else. I mean, I think that's another part of the story that we didn't totally understand when we went into this, but that we really also gravitated to was just how much Julia evolved and changed and how she dealt with setbacks like, you know, PBS pushing her a little off to the side. And so then she goes to ABC and also, you know, some personal challenges uh, that she faced in terms of, you know, her attitude about homosexuals, uh, which I think reflects many people of her generation and, and below the, their, their attitudes where there was just kind of a casual homophobia that people took for granted. And then Julia, did such an about face that we found that moving. I mean, she really was a person who just kept learning and, you know, absorbing new ideas and, you know, making connections with people all of her life. She did. She did. And she and she proved to be uh, a model for for many other people coming after her. Um, so you had letters, you had diary entries. Uh, did you have any material that was never before uh, on screen that that you were able were able to, to bring to light? You know, some of the some of the video footage, um, some of the behind the scenes uh, footage from uh, deep within the 1960s and I think even more 70s archives of WGBH of um, not just the shows themselves, which obviously had been seen before, but some of the behind scenes of the scenes footage of sh especially some of the shoots that were done uh, in in Europe. Um, was uh, never before seen stuff. You know, some photos uh, here and there were, were original. Some of this, some of this stuff has been out there, but it's a matter of how it was put together. Like that, you know, this, the, do, doing a full feature length doc on on Julia was a new project. Amazingly, like this is someone who's deserved a doc for a long time. Uh, we were excited to do it now, and then of course we we started this in 2019 and did our big shoot in in france actually in the fall just before uh the lockdown hit and then of course julia's whole story as you suggested before really hits in a whole different way um in a time when we're all kind of at home in our kitchens cooking food for our pods as a way of uh comforting uh one another and i think we felt that you know making the film as well as we hope people feel watching it what were some of the COVID challenges for you? Uh, you talked about that one uh, shoot, but were there others? Well, yeah, we had we had done the bulk of the shooting, but we hadn't shot the food because we really wanted to wait to see how it fit into the story. And there were a couple of interviews that we had to do with COVID protocols. And also, 
you know, a slowdown in getting archived because a lot of the archive house is completely shut down. And then when they opened up, they opened up in a with skeletal crews. And so that was challenging for us, but, um, you know, and challenging for the Schlesinger Library also. I mean, we're all operating with these protocols for safety and we really did want to be as safe as possible. And thank goodness, the, the you know, nothing bad happened, but that did slow things down. That said, uh, it's kind of amazing to us how quickly we were able to just uh, pivot into working virtually. You know, so we were the week after the shutdown and, you know, Carla had gone to her home office in New Jersey, Julie's in Brooklyn, I'm in Manhattan, and our producers in Brooklyn, Holly Siegel, and we're just on Zoom in the mornings. And Carla, because of the technology now, would be able to do cuts and upload things and we'd look at them and we'd all be working on our Google Docs. I mean, it's pretty, the cloud technology is pretty incredible and allowed us uh, to keep going. So Julia died in, in 2004. Um, did you find as you were putting this together that, that, there was, that, that there wasn't quite as much video material as you would have liked? I mean, there were the shows themselves, but you didn't want to repeat yourselves too much. Um, I mean, what, what, what kind of limitations did you have to overcome? Yeah, you know, I think we all kind of wanted this film to feel poetic. Um, from the start and in a lot of ways, those incredible stills that Paul took, which really are professional looking photographs, we felt helped us with a poetic feeling between the food shooting, all of the words that are just words that we don't have like an actor reading, but just a, you're just, you're sort of giving the audience the experience of kind of drinking it in themselves while they're seeing beautiful images and sometimes a couple images at a time and some food, behind, you know, like I think in our, mind while we initially went in thinking like what we're what we're seeking is like all of this old archival footage of julia when we started really looking at the stills i think you know carla said she'd never had this much of kind of like a feast of, oh, of visuals from the so it, it felt to us like that was i don't know somehow kind of it, the the tone was right with this story like it, we didn't want it to seem like modern jazzy tv age stuff it like we it, it, it made it kind of more vintagey which I, I think was nice agreed and anything more uh, on that no i mean you know you're always looking for great behind the scenes moments and i, I think we we did find a few in france with julia in the markets and julia cooking in her home and the, you know there were some some nice some nice additions there, but I agree the photographs were a real revelation, something that we hadn't expected, the quality. And, you know, Carla really dug into that. We also benefited because, you know, some of Julia's, not only Julia's niece and nephew were able to bring Julia to life, but Julia's amazing female friends in Cambridge and her friend Ann Willen in London. I mean, these older feisty women who also we felt were kind of channeling Julia and helping us. And you had um, the conflict, which I found fascinating with her co-author. Um, yeah, uh, yes. Tell yeah. us a little more about what went on there. Well, you know, Simone Beck and Julia had kind of like a sisterly relationship. They started off as like just such close friends and they immediately started collaborating and that led to great, you know, superstardom, but then some conflict as, you know, it, it led, it led to a very successful best-selling book. Let's put it that way. Julia became a superstar. Simca I defy went back anyone not to own yeah. that book. We yeah. always yeah. own that uh, book. Went back to her, you know, did her book tour in the U.S. and then went back to France where these women were not famous. So all of a sudden, you know, and Julia's show is taking off and she's becoming such a phenomenon, completely household word. I mean, of course, Bet Betsy and I remember that. And the, I mean, to a certain extent, a lot of people are still familiar with Julia, but in the 60s and 70s, like Julia Child was like the thing. Um, that was not true of Simca Beck. So not surprisingly, that led to tension and you know, uh, over money and uh, over all kinds of things. I mean, we, we, we liked that storyline. We were so happy that we were able 
to connect with Simka's nephew, who actually um, has lived in the States, uh, is a professor at George Washington University and has been there um, for, I think, since the, he's been in the U.S. since the 60s. So having his, you know, being a very French guy, but with the American perspective of knowing what Julia meant in this country and like not pulling a whole lot of punches where, you know, we love the way he did. Well, we, uh, I, interviewing the French people was so much fun for this project. <laughs> they just brought so much uh, zest and, and his his description of his, uh, you know, gendarme police like <laughs> um, Aunt Simca was not an easy woman. <laughs> right. not an easy woman. So this movie is such a culturally rich uh, document, really. It's it's just so much fun. It's sophisticated and and global, and it, it takes you into all these beautiful uh, places. Um, let me let me ask another question. You guys were um, working on two movies at the same time. I know I know you've been talking about my name is Polly Murray also. How did the two films um, uh, collide or overlap? Uh, what, what, what were you, uh, what came first and, and how did you finish them during, during COVID? Yeah, well, COVID kind of stretched out the process, I think. And in fact, we had started working on Polly Murray before Julia and, um, you know, we spent, so we were already doing some shooting on Polly when we came up with the idea of of uh, Julia, which took about a year to kind of, you know, get going. So, you know, we had always thought that Polly would come out first and then and then Julia, but due to uh, circumstances beyond our control, they are both, um, you know, they, they have both come out this fall. Uh, we had two different fantastic teams working on each one of them. I mean, this is, you know, as you know, these are incredible collaborations and, um, you know, that made it possible for us to move from one to the other. I mean, you know, they were both, I mean, we, we felt so lucky, frankly, um, in the middle of this extremely difficult time for everybody to have these two engaging and, you know, and frankly, inspiring people to be focusing on, you know, during a pretty difficult time. Yeah, Polly Murray is, is a, a great character too. In, in 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 their own right um, absolutely they, they would be yeah. bi non-binary now i suspect <laughs> yeah well um well what else are you working on tell me what you've got well, is it all <laughs> is it all women all the time well, what's the deal we're well, not quite telling you yet but we will we're, we're actually very heavily into an edit of the another incredibly inspiring story of a phenomenal woman Still, still living, uh, but we're not saying quite yet who that is because we haven't made the uh, project public at her request and, and our, ours, but uh, you can be watching for that uh, next year. I look forward. I look forward very much. All right. Um, I feel like we've covered it. Um, if anyone has an area they want to discuss, we can get into it, but I think, I think we're, we're kind of done. Um, yeah. I know we have we could have more time, but you guys you answered my questions beautifully. Good. Thank fast you. talkers. <laughs> Very fast. All right. Thank you, Andrea, too, as well, always. Thank you, Andrea. So nice to see Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Appreciate it.